Today, some perceive Farah Pahlavi, the wife of the last Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, as a symbol of a secular nation free from religious extremism. However, there are many who view her as the embodiment of the authoritarian opulence of the Iranian monarchy. Regardless, this woman, who has survived not only her husband, but also two out of her four children, has left a significant mark in history and deserves respect. But not everyone knows who the last empress of Iran truly was, the formidable challenges she had to face, and how she lives today. Watch the full video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. And here we go. The prospective spouse of Iranian monarch Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, Farah Diba, was born in Tehran in 1938 to a family with a military background. Her father, the son of a distinguished diplomat who served the Russian Romanov emperors, received an excellent education at the French military academy Saint-Cyr. Being part of the Iranian aristocracy and considered one of the most respected families in the country, Farah was expected to uphold her societal position. Her parents took great care to instill in her the manners of a true lady, providing lessons in French, history, and literature. Farah's father, with progressive views, opposed her wearing the hijab, envisioning her receiving a quality education in France and finding a worthy life companion there. Driven by a fear of disappointing her father, Farah, from a young age, dedicated herself to studying and self-improvement. Faradiba distinguished herself from her peers through intelligence and determination, yet she maintained an amiable and cheerful demeanor. Attending the Jeanne d'Arc school in Tehran, Farah not only excelled academically, but also achieved recognition for her athletic prowess. Actively participating in basketball, she even captained the school team. Despite being intelligent, beautiful, and athletic, Farah remained humble, never looking down on others, and was always ready to assist her classmates. Consequently, the future queen-to-be did not attract malicious envy. Instead, she garnered love and admiration from everyone. Teachers characterized Farah as a hard-working individual with a delicate soul. After completing her school education, the determined young woman chose to rigorously adhere to her father's wishes and joined the École Spéciale d'Architecture in Paris. Despite being perceived as a male-dominated institution, this did not deter the courageous Farah. She successfully navigated all entrance exams and wholeheartedly devoted herself to her studies. The schedule at one of the premier architectural institutes in Europe was exceptionally demanding, allowing the student only one break. This occurred in 1959, when Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the ruler of her native country, visited Paris on an official visit. Farah Diba was expected to be among the distinguished guests at the ceremonial evening dedicated to the monarch at the Iranian embassy. During that period, Pahlavi was not married. It had only been a year since he had separated from his wife, Soraya, and he was in search of a new spouse. He was in need of a woman who would be worthy of becoming the Shah's wife and could also bear him an heir to the throne. Before the event, Farah's classmates jokingly quipped, Why not let the Shah propose to you? You're such a smart and beautiful girl. She chuckled along with her friends, unaware of how close this jest was to reality. The memory of that joke resurfaced when she encountered the Shah face to face. Farah arrived at the embassy adorned in a black and white tweed suit with a camellia on the lapel, exuding modesty and charm. She stood out from the crowd of guests, and the Shah approached her for a conversation. Mohammad Reza Pahlavi shook hands with the young student and inquired about her academic achievements. Initially, Farah felt embarrassed, but she soon composed herself and smilingly responded to the Shah's inquiries. Soon, she forgot about this fleeting encounter and began preparing for exams and summer vacation. Unbeknownst to her, the Shah had already considered everything and was getting ready to propose. Later, Muhammad recounted that he immediately understood, 
before him was the one, the only woman he wanted to make his own. To avoid startling Farah, Muhammad began to act very delicately. Initially, the girl was invited to the home of Ardashir Zahedi, a relative of the Shah and an official responsible for the scholarships of Iranian students abroad. Farah thought it would be about some financial matters. By chance, the Shah was present at Zahedi's house, and another brief, seemingly insignificant conversation occurred between him and Farah. During that time, the girl did not suspect that the meeting was planned. However, soon she was invited to dinner by the Shah's sister, and after that, Farah almost had no doubts that encounters with someone like Mohammad Reza Pahlavi were not coincidental. Therefore, when, after dinner, the ruler wanted to talk to her alone, the girl was mentally prepared for a proposal. Everything happened very simply. Muhammad said that he had been unhappily married twice and asked if Farah would agree to be his wife. Without hesitation, the girl said, yes. They didn't delay the matter and the wedding was scheduled for the end of the eventful year 1959 on December 20th. The ceremony was very lavish. Yves Saint Laurent himself designed the wedding dress for the bride, and it was crafted at Dior's Atelier. The bridal tiara was commissioned from the renowned U.S. jeweler Harry Winston. It featured 325 selected diamonds, and the total weight of the precious piece amounted to 2 kilograms. Not without its share of incidents, though. Already en route to the groom with the procession, Farah horrifyingly remembered that she had forgotten the groom's wedding ring at home. It was too late to turn back, so Ardashir Zahedi, accompanying her, came to the rescue. He handed her his own wedding ring. There were no more hiccups, except that the bride, according to tradition, did not wait for the customary threefold question of consent, but immediately answered, yes. After the wedding, the most challenging part awaited Farah. She had to face the envy and gossip that always surrounded princesses and queens. But Farah, a wise 20-year-old, skillfully avoided conflicts and provocations. Her dignified behavior as the young wife of the Shah immediately elevated her authority in the eyes of the numerous relatives of the monarch holding important state positions. Unlike many other monarchs' wives, Farah was not just a companion to the Shah. Her education allowed the young queen to contribute to the country in areas such as health care and culture. Nevertheless, she understood that the expectations from her extended beyond serving the country selflessly. They also encompassed bearing an heir to the throne. For 20 years, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi awaited the birth of a son, and only his third wife, on October 31, 1960, gave him an heir. The childbirth took place not in an elite clinic, but in a hospital in one of the poorest districts of Tehran. This move aimed to demonstrate the royal family's proximity to the common people. The people enthusiastically embraced the arrival of the heir and the clever move with the hospital, for the less fortunate deeply moved thousands of Iranians to tears. Later, Farah gave birth to three more little Pahlavis, thereby solidifying her position in the monarch's family. After the birth of the heir, Farah could consider her main mission fulfilled and dedicate herself to what she passionately dreamed of, serving her country. The young queen did not forget to fully enjoy life. She discovered her passion for collecting works of art. The Shah couldn't have been prouder of his wife's successes. In 1967, he declared his wish to crown Farah, transforming her from a queen consort into a full-fledged empress. No wife of the Shah had been honored with such a title since the 7th century. In the event of the Shah's death, if the heir did not reach the age required to inherit the throne, the ruler would be the empress. However, it would be a mistake to think that everyone was thrilled with the queen. Muslim religious leaders, led by Imam Khomeini, believed that the king and his wife were leading the country into the abyss of Western decadence. 
Their goal was to overthrow the progressive Shah and establish their rule based on Islamic values. Muhammad grew tired of it and ordered the military to disperse the crowd, giving them complete freedom of action. After a series of provocations, the soldiers opened fire on the crowd, and hundreds of citizens perished from bullets and stampedes. Following this, it was impossible to stop the opposition. Riots first engulfed the capital and then spread throughout the country, to the extent that even the army betrayed the Shah and the power of the legitimate ruler, lacking support, collapsed. This happened in December 1978. The Pahlavi family urgently left the country where they faced mortal danger. Life in exile was difficult for the Shah's family, especially for the ailing and elderly Mohammed. Later, Farah revealed that just a few days after their escape, she received a letter from the revolutionaries. They proposed a despicable deal, to poison her husband in exchange for permission to return to Iran with the children. The scoundrel's letter went unanswered. In 1980, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi died of cancer, a heavy blow for the queen. However, fate had more trials in store for this woman in an attempt to break her will. In 2001, her 31-year-old daughter Layla died in London from a drug overdose and in 2011, the heir to the throne, 44-year-old Ali Reza, took his own life in Boston. In 2024, Farah Pahlavi will turn 85. She resides in the United States in a small yet luxuriously furnished apartment. She is surrounded by exquisite sculptures, paintings by renowned artists, and photographs of dear individuals who have long been gone. The woman has not only outlived her husband, but also her daughter Layla and son Ali Reza. She thinks of them every day but cannot allow herself to succumb to despair, for she lives for Iran and its people, even though they are separated from her. Farah always said that her children couldn't overcome the childhood stress they experienced during the Islamic Revolution. The queen herself, although not having been in Iran since 1979, speaks about deep concern for the fate of her country. She is particularly saddened by the situation of Iranian women whose rights she fought for vigorously in her time. Under her influence, an unprecedented event occurred. The number of women entering universities exceeded the number of men. Of course, now this could only be remembered. She closely follows the achievements of her compatriots who haven't accepted the return to the Middle Ages and are fighting for their rights and freedoms. Farah says that the women of her country are very courageous, and among them, many were not influenced by the teachings of the clerics. She hopes that one day their struggle will be successful and they will achieve what they desired. Farah is full of optimism. This light is capable of overcoming any darkness. Even if I am not there, my children and grandchildren can reap the fruits of these efforts.